This morning, we'll look at Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. This morning, the Lord promises a new covenant through the promise of Jeremiah. He promises to forgive our sins and to remember them no more. God sees our brokenness, but God also sees the healing of our sins in Christ Jesus. Grace, mercy, and peace be yours today from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I promise to be faithful to you as long as we both shall live. You recognize those words perhaps if you have been married in the church. They're the words that are a part of the marriage service, aren't they? And they've been a part of our marriage service for well over a hundred years. Faithfulness is what it talks about, right? The idea that we will be faithful to one another in Christ as a couple for the time that God gives us in this world. Of course, sin enters in and that doesn't always happen. But that's the way, that's the ideal. That's the way God intended it from the beginning and that's what Adam and Eve enjoyed in paradise. That idyllic kind of a relationship which was both nurture and unconditional love. In the Old Testament, we see that God likes to use that image because he always seems to refer to himself there as a husband to Israel. And then, of course, we're familiar in the New Testament about how God uses the same image again, only this time Christ is the bridegroom and you and I, the new Israel of God, are the bride, the church. Faithfulness and love and nurture is what forms the center of Jeremiah's message from God today in his prophecy in chapter 31. It's a part of the chapters of consolation surrounded by God's word of judgment for his people. But it's in Christ, you see, in the fullness of Christ that our salvation has been complete and free and given to us is a gift of God. And so as we look at this particular scripture this morning and consider the watchwords of the Reformation, grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone, I want us to bring our attention to that first thought of the three, which is grace alone. This morning, Jeremiah's words bring to life the message of God's New Testament established in grace. The prophet Jeremiah was born in Anathoth. That's, oh, maybe three miles northeast of Jerusalem on that central mountain range. It overlooked the Jordan Valley, and you could look up the heights and see the holy city of God, Jerusalem. Anathoth was a priestly city. It had been ever since the, uh, the tabernacle was brought into the area. It had been the city of the high priest Abiathar, very likely one of Jeremiah's uh, forefathers. Abiathar, you may or may not remember, was David's high priest. But he was exiled to his estate in Anathoth when he failed to support Solomon's accession, accession to the throne. Jeremiah was born in a place of controversy, in a time of controversy, and his ministry in Jerusalem was marked by controversy. And now today, in chapter 31, the Babylonians are at the gates of the city. God's judgment is coming upon Israel. 
It's 600 years before the birth of Christ. And the people of God had been unfaithful to the Lord. You recall, perhaps, as we read earlier, God said, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. God had always been faithful to Israel, his people. But Israel had not always been faithful to God. Israel, in this illustration, is an adulteress. And she had been from the beginning. Because you remember, as God took his people by the hand and led them out of Egypt and brought them to the mountain of God at Horeb, or also called Mount Sinai, and gave them the law. And he said, if you fulfill the precepts of my covenant, I will be your God and you will be my people. And the people all gathered around the holy mountain of God and said, we will. And then God called Moses up the holy mountain. And he was gone for 40 days. And 40 days after Israel had established their covenant with God and God his covenant with them, their trust in the Lord who had delivered them with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm began to waver. And they built a golden calf and they worshipped the calf and they said, Behold Israel, this, this is your God. And from that day forward, the Old Testament is filled with Israel's adulteries chasing after false gods of other nations. And God coming back to Israel again and again and in love and nurture calling him back to him in unconditional love through his spirit prompting them to repentance so that he might forgive their sins. The old covenant was a conditional covenant. It was conditioned upon the observance of the laws that God had laid down. But Israel had been unable to keep it. They were not able to live up to the standard of perfection that God required of them. And they repeatedly wandered from his love. And we understand that, don't we? Because... It's easy with the distractions of this world in our own lives to wander from his love, to look elsewhere for our hope and our trust and our joy, just as the people of God at the very mountain of God where the fire of the Lord rumbled atop the mountain turned away to an image made of gold. Well, God was now going to bring his judgment upon his nation. The people had been saying previously to this, the little proverb, the fathers ate sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Meaning, God, you're punishing me for my, my dad and my granddad's sins. It's not fair, Lord. You're not just. You're not merciful. Your judgment is not righteous. But God says to the prophet Jeremiah today, my judgment is righteous. I do not judge you for other people's sins. I am judging you today because of your own sins. Because you see, God is a righteous God. God is a perfect and holy God. God demands perfection. And as we look into the mirror of God's law, and we see ourselves reflected there, we have to join St. Paul in saying, God, forgive me, a poor, miserable sinner. Because if you're like me, you'll never be able to keep God's law perfectly. You never will. And so we need something new. We need something, not just for Israel, but for all of us. We need a new covenant. We need a Savior. 
And God the Lord today promises that very thing to us through the prophet Jeremiah. God's love comes to us overflowing and nurturing us and love needs to be nurtured and God is a faithful God, the faithful bridegroom and he does love us and he does take care of us even when we go astray he even is faithful in calling us back to him. And what does God say in his law that prompts us to cry out for a savior? He said, if you don't love your neighbor as yourself, my judgment upon you is death. Eternal death. If you have failed to help those in need or speak well of them, my judgment upon you is death. If you've ever coveted anything, if you've ever been angry with yourself or anyone else, if you've ever wished for revenge, if you've lusted after something or someone, my judgment upon you is death. And he keeps going. If you failed to give your respect to your parents, to your teachers, to your pastor, to your government, my answer to you is death. If you don't esteem the Lord as dear to you than anything or anyone else in your life, my judgment upon you is death. If you don't hold my word and commands in the highest regard, if you don't follow them faithfully, my judgment upon you is death. I was gone at the first one. I was. We all were. Because you see, apart from Christ, we can never measure up. We can never do it right. We will always miss the mark. And so what do we do? To whom do we go? Where are the words of eternal life, the hope of forgiveness and salvation that we all so desperately need? Hear God's words through Jeremiah the prophet to his people. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbors saying to one another, Know the Lord because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord. There is a similarity in the covenants, old and new. The Old Testament looks forward to the hope of the Messiah, the promise of God's love. The New Testament looks backward at the fulfillment of that promise 2,000 years ago on a blood-drenched cross and in an empty tomb. But they are also different covenants. They are different in this way. The Old Testament was established on the blood of goats and bulls to draw the people's eyes to the coming of the Messiah. And the New Covenant is established by God with all people, not just Israel, but all the world. In the blood of His Son, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and that's a difference, a big difference. That's the difference it makes in our lives. Because the last phrase that we read, the last phrase of God's promise to us is this, for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. 
words of hope, words of consolation, words of love, words that take a fallen soul and nurture it in the mercy and grace of the Lord working through word and spirit and lifting us up from the mire of our sins and putting us in a beautiful place in the robe of Christ's righteousness through the gift of faith because of God's surprising and marvelous grace. And that grace is free for you. And it's free for me. Because you see, salvation has been complete. There's nothing more to do and none of us need do anything. For Christ has done it all. Our sins have been paid for in full. And there's nothing left to atone for. For Christ has atoned for all of our sins. From the moment of our birth to the moment of our death. And that wonderful, wonderful grace of God is free for the asking. For it's available for all people. Remember what Jesus said to Nicodemus that night in the garden? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but should have eternal life. And do you recall the words of St. Paul as he wrote to the Christian church in Ephesus? For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this, not of yourselves. It's the free gift of God. Not by works. So that no one can boast. You and I, you see, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus that we might do good works. Not works that attain anything, not works that merit anything, but simply in the response of grace through faith, the things that God has wanted and prepared us to do beforehand. Because you see the merit, the merit is Christ. And we belong to him. And through the waters of holy baptism, where God connects his word in spirit, he comes to each one of us and he makes his new covenant with you and with me. He gives to us there his amazing grace and the gift of faith and the promise of sins forgiven. He comes to us in the new covenant and shares with us his divine meal. And there in that wonderful communion of oneness with Christ, he gives us the bread which is his body broken on the cross. He gives us his blood which is his wine, the wine which is his blood poured out for us on the cross. For the, and there in that wonderful communion of oneness with Christ, he gives us the bread which is his body broken on the cross. He gives us his blood which is his wine, the wine which is his blood poured out for us on the cross for the assurance that our sins are forgiven. And he comes to us personally in this holy meal. Himself. And he says to us, you have been forgiven and I forgive you. And he does that simply because, because he loves you. Because he loves you as weak and frail and as imperfect as we are. Nevertheless, he loves you. And that's the message of the new covenant. That unconditional love of God. That is yours and mine today, right now. In Jesus.
I promise, I promise to be faithful to you even unto death. When my wife and I made that promise, with God's help, we have come a long way together. And we have a ways to go yet before the Lord calls us home. But at some point, that promise will end. God has made you a promise. A promise of faithfulness and love. I will forgive your wickedness and remember your sins no more. That promise of forgiveness brings eternal life. And God's promise to you is eternal. It will never end. And so today, God calls us to live in that grace, to live in that new covenant, to live our lives in the blood of Jesus with our eyes on the empty tomb in full assurance and hope of life to come. May God enable you to live in the loving nurture of His grace today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Join us for worship Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock with Bible study and Sunday school at 1030. Or find us on the web at emmanuelnrh.net.